Greetings. Let's continue the thought about coaching your group of sages to connect with the arriving generation. Now, it's probably preferable if you uh, take some of these ideas and develop your own material and coaching them and helping them and then create a structure or system that facilitates and encourages and even maybe keeps accountable these points of connection taking place. Think about your group of sages. There may be three, there may be 300. Whatever the group size is, you won't know all of their stories. And even if you are intimately acquainted with the person, it is unlikely that you know the entirety of their story. But the part you do know, how could those experiences and that wisdom benefit someone who is younger? I think very few people would feel that none of those things have value. But those experiences, for the most part, are locked away. They're in an inaccessible library of the person's mind. The insight has not been written. It's not been recorded. It's not even been communicated to someone of the arriving generation. I've asked you to think about solving these problems, and hopefully you have done so, and also forwarded them to me at my email address. But let's think about it. How can we solve this problem? Well, the first is this. I think we need to elevate the value of the story of every sage. Sages tend to not recognize the value of their life experiences. Once we have gone through something, we tend to put it in the rear view mirror. And as life goes further and further ahead, it's more distant and it has less and less significance. But when you listen to their story, when you listen to their experiences, you begin to recognize here the handiwork of God was on display. When I read the book of Psalms, Chronicles, the, the book of Chronicles themselves bring to mind the work of an ancient chronicler who would record the events in any kingdom. It was his job. It was reading such a chronicle that caused King Ahasuerus to choose to honor Mordecai. The chronicles of your sages, the chronicles of their past, the chronicles of the miracles they've experienced, of the tragedies that they have endured. All of those things can influence, encourage, and build up those who are coming behind. When they're brought to the surface, your sages have compelling experiences that can make a difference for others. The key is how do we bring them to the surface? I suppose it was 30 plus years ago that I ran across a little spiral bound book in uh, a card shop. The name of the book was Grandpa Tell Me Your Memories. My grandfather, H.B. Frazier, was a church planner in Tioga, Louisiana. And uh, this book caught my attention because it provided a question for each day of the week. And so my grandfather was already in his uh, mid to late 80s at this point, and I would call him periodically, and we would work through several of those questions, and he would give me answers to the questions. I didn't get through the book in its entirety before my grandfather died, but the third of the book I got through was so beneficial because his stories and experiences as a child and young adult during World War II, they were so compelling. Things I'd never heard, things that I would never have known if there had not been an intentional effort and a resource that I could use to pull that out of my grandfather. When I realized the significance of what uh, was there, I ran across another book, Dad, Tell Me Your Memories, and and I bought it. My dad completed part of a similar book. And I have one that I'm working on for, for my boys and for my grandkids. And 
as someone who is involved with sages, I encourage you to complete a book like that for your kids and grandkids. That is an unlocking of the library. That's giving access to inside experience and wisdom that you otherwise would not know. So here's how to unlock the library. From my experience with dad and grandpa came a, a book that I've used in a number of settings, Elders Tell Me Your Memories. The questions in the book help bring a sage's memory to light, things they've not thought about in a long time. What was the first Christian concert you went to? Tell me about the day when you received the Holy Ghost. Tell me about your experience when you were baptized in Jesus' name. Where did it happen? What was that day like? What did you feel like after it took place? Now, you don't have to use my book, but use something similar or develop your own to help your sages bring the past to life. And you can use this kind of question as discussion starters in some of your meetings. Also, technology has changed the universe with nothing more than a cell phone. Video your sages and, and put those in a sages archive locally and, and perhaps in time even nationally or internationally. You're going to discover other uses for those testimonies and those videos that are going to make a great difference. Okay. The second problem that we identified is that wisdom, knowledge, and insight is not being transitioned from one generation to the next. Let's think about solutions. Okay. When and where it fits, use something like elders tell me your memories as a resource, but then add another component. And this component is going to require the support and planning from your pastor. And I've done this, where that I had younger people in a midweek service use selected questions to interview someone of the sage age who is not part of their family. In some instances, this will be the most intergenerational activity there has been in the church in a long time. Something happens during those conversations. One generation tends to not trust another because we never trust those with whom we have little contact. But when there is this kind of conversation that happens and there comes the awareness of the struggles, the realities of this elder's life, Generational distrust gives way to mutual confidence and trust in each other. The second thing that I watched happen is that the young begin respecting and valuing the sacrifices of people who are older. They can talk about buying land on which to build a church or donating land. Or my grandfather could tell me the story of uh, the timber that was on a little piece of land he owned and the trees being cut and taken to the sawmill and, and all of the wood in the church where I received the Holy Ghost came from his little plot of ground. Those things help us to see that it's cost somebody something to get us where we're at. And there is a respect and value that comes. The third is that young people are really any person who does not have direct interaction with another does not know the story of the ups and downs of their life. And we all have them. Nobody gets out of life unscarred. Nobody. There's not a sage in your group who doesn't have wounds, and some of those wounds are not healed. In these conversations, the younger began to realize that the sages carried scars 
from marital breakdowns, a divorce that they didn't even know had happened 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, the death of a child, a, a bankruptcy, someone dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder left from Korea or Vietnam, the Gulf War, elsewhere. When, when people see me in my Sunday clothes, they have no idea of my own personal battle with depression that's been part of my life for a long time. This interaction, this interaction matters. It matters. It creates a unity in the body of Christ that cannot be accomplished through silos. What happened is that I would watch as teens would step over to pray with someone of a sage age and sages would start showing up at a college graduation and school plays. And after church, we would see people in their 70s having extended conversations and laughing with people in their, in their 20s. This, this process of change, this interaction, this osmosis, this unity that was developed. You're familiar with the story of Elijah and Elisha. It's interesting. It's compelling. Elijah passed his mantle over Elisha compelling the younger man to sacrifice oxen and leave his work on the farm to traipse around the country with the prophet. And Elisha was likely near when Elijah confronted Ahab about the threat of Naboth's vineyard. And Elisha would have been there looking on when the old prophet spoke against the king of Samaria and watched the subsequent interaction with Elijah and the messengers that the king of Samaria would send. Historians think that Elisha hung out with Elijah for six years. What's interesting is that Elijah was not present for a single miracle that Elijah participated in. Not one. All Elisha had ever seen was Elijah being confrontational, being a man of God in difficult times. But in six years, Elisha saw enough and heard enough by his association with the sage that he knew he wanted what Elijah had. And Elisha ended up with Elijah's mantle and a duplication and multiplication of his ministry. Elisha's ambition and his pursuit, his approach of the future came from observation and conversation. Osmosis, just hanging out, spending time with the sage. If you can facilitate that, you will impact the future.